Hey everybody, this is Car Ray Rob. I'm Ray. I'm Rob. And tonight we are kicking off our Fashionably Late Review series with The Sweet Smell of Success. All right, Rob, so we're doing something new here with our Fashionably Late series. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you explain to everybody what it is? Uh, well, one thing I really hate is when like a modern reviewer takes something that, you know, is held as a classic. So something like The Godfather, yeah. 2001 A Space Odyssey, and they decide to do a new review for it. You and do it, hate that. I, I really do, because it, it's like, you know, you've studied it. So many people have studied it. There's been so many reviews written. It's taught in, you know, in yeah. film schools. It's, it's like, Everybody what's the point? You're not going to add anyway. anything new to the conversation. It's very rare. So most of the time you're just either kind of pontificating on, you know, stuff you've already heard before. Or you're or just you're, trying to be different. Right, you're trying to be a contrarian, exactly. So what I wanted to do is, I wanted to you know take a movie that is either held as a classic or a cult favorite and get a new set of eyes on it. I, so, I have not like seen Ray. this movie yet. Yeah, exactly. And it would you know, be vice versa. So, uh, you know, I, I think it could be pretty interesting. And sure, we were hopefully, fun. You know, yeah, hopefully we can have some fun with it. So tonight we are doing The Sweet Smell of Success. Yes, we are. Yep, it's one of my top 10 favorite movies of all time. Love this movie. Tony Curtis plays a guy named Sidney Falco, okay. uh, opposite Burt Lancaster, who plays J.J. Hunsecker, uh, who's listed on AFI Top 50 Villains of All Time. And Ooh. you will see why if you see this movie. He's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Uh, but uh, Sidney Falco is a publicist. And uh, J.G. Hunsaker is a columnist, mm. and you know he's the big name columnist, politicians, actors, actresses. If your name is in his column, you're gonna be famous. So, so he's got to kiss Falco, up to him. Yep, Sidney Falco has to kiss up to him. Uh, J.J. kind of gets him in, wrangles him in to do a favor for him that he doesn't seem like he's gonna be able to do. But schemer, you know, constant slimy schemer. So it's gonna be a it's gonna be a fun ride, I think, for Ray. Okay, well we're gonna go check this movie out as. Uh, while we're doing that, we're going to let you guys watch the trailer of the movie, see what we're coming back with, and go from there. Yeah. Be right back. Burt Lancaster as J.J. Hunsecker, world-famed columnist whose gossip is gospel to 60 million readers. Tony Curtis as Sidney Falco, the kid who had ideas about taking over. But we happen to know I'm your star pupil. Because I reflect back to you, your own talent. I'd hate to take a bite of you. You're a cookie full of arsenic. <laughs> Don't turn your back on him. You might find a knife in it. This is their story, and that of the big shots and big names who worship the sweet smell of success. Along Broadway, throughout Hollywood. Down Wall Street. On Capitol Hill, sweet smell of success. We're friends, Javi. We go as far back as when you were a fresh kid congressman, don't we? Why is it that everything you say sounds like a threat? Maybe it's a mannerism, because I don't threaten friends. But why furnish your enemies with ammunition? And here you are, out in the open, where any hep person knows that this one is toting that one around for you. Sydney is a great salesman. He'd sell anything to get there. Just ask his girl. Sydney, I don't do this sort of thing. What sort of thing? This sort of thing. You need him for a favor, don't you? Well, so do I. I need his column tonight. All you think about is yourself and your column. You see yourself as some sort of a, a national glory. To me and lots of people like me, your, your slimy scandal and your phony patriotics. To me, Mr. Hunsecker, you're a national disgrace. Burt Lancaster as the almighty J.J. Hunsecker. Tony Curtis as his man of all dirty work. Introducing Susan Harrison and the Chico Hamilton Quintet. JJ, please. Look, I can explain. Why you put your hands on my sister. 
Okay, so we're just back. got done watching watching it. the movie. So let's dive right in. Do it. All right, Ray. Sure. What worked? I'm ready. What didn't go? Well, uh, let's just start start off with I think my favorite thing in the whole movie, which was the main character. I think Sidney Falco. Yeah. Tony Curtis. I thought his character was awesome. He's really complicated and layered. Um, you know, and I can't comment too much on like what the audience remember, what audience people thought in the '50s. But to me, I can imagine um, just. The, he almost being a character ahead of his times because he's just so he's so got so much depth to him. He's slimy, but sometimes he doesn't even come across as slimy because he's so in it for himself. Like there's parts where he's arguing with people because he's caught in a lie. Yeah, but he's arguing his way out of the lie, and he, you almost think, is he just trying to get out of this lie, or is he trying to like lie to himself, like sure. trick himself into thinking he didn't do that bad thing? Right. And I feel like that's really an interesting. You know, mindset for a character. Sure. Well, and it's funny, you know, you bring up the audience members in the 50s. Well, they actually hated him. Really? Yeah, they were uh, really against seeing Tony Curtis as this slimy schemer type character. They were used to seeing him as the funny, charismatic mm -hmm. guy, you know, some like it hot, that sure. type of thing. And you know, to see him as Sidney Falco, they really kind of turned on the movie. But critically, it did well. And as you've seen, it ages really well. Yeah. So that character is still, I think, feel relevant now sure. just as much as it was then. Yeah, and, and he's just got a, he just has a great arc because like early in the movie you see him like selling out the cigarette girl yeah. for his own personal gain. Then you like see him selling out um, like Hunsicker's uh, sister for his own personal gain. And at the end of the movie eventually he's like he, he basically sells out himself. Yeah. And it all catches up with you sooner or later and he has to find that out. But it's just it's an interesting journey to watch. Like is there a line that he won't cross? And we're not we don't I don't know if we ever get the answer to that. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. All right, Robin, one part of the movie that I know you really loved was the J.J. Huntsinger character, yep. the bad guy character. And I will say he just oozes evil yeah. throughout the movie. Absolutely. Well, he, he is on AFI's top 50 villains of all time. I think he's like number 35, somewhere right around there. Sure. And he definitely earns that. Burn Lancaster really knocks it out of the park. Uh, that introduction scene in the yeah. restaurant with the senator and his girl. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that whole scene, you know, and Sidney Falco comes from behind and he doesn't even see him, doesn't even look at him, but he knows he's there. The guys in the back of his head. Yeah. And it just, he speaks with such command that, you know, it's really just an amazing, amazing performance. Yeah, and one kind of thing that I thought was interesting about that scene was it happens kind of like not late in the movie, but not early either. It's like 20 minutes in yeah. before you actually get to meet him. Yeah, you know, and they do a really great job of, through dialogue, introducing J.J. Hunsaker. So, you know, they, they really build him up as being this ruthless type character, really powerful. And, you know, it's really great when they, they do that and the, the actual actor delivers on it. You know, I really hate in a movie when, you know, they, they go through all that trouble and when you finally see the person, you're like, oh, Okay, yeah. But uh, Burt Lancaster nails it, knocks it out of the park. He's every bit as evil as they make him out to be, and it's just an amazing performance. And I'll play some naiveness with the culture of the '50s, but I kind of found it a little weird that he was just like I don't know. I don't want to say just a columnist, but you know, because he does play this evil, like foreboding, powerful person. He could have easily been like a, you know. You could have said he was a politician or a mob boss. You wouldn't have known any different. I mean, think he would have played him the same. But um, you know, being just a columnist, though, you definitely see in the movie how he can use that power of the column. Um, so it worked. I'm not saying it didn't work. I just thought you know, it's an inter it's an interesting kind of thing. Yeah, so I think it's like time. You know, time. When it, yeah, thing. like when, yeah, when it when it came out. You yeah. know, obviously at that point, newspaper was the you know. A, the, one of the main sources right. still of information in the country. So, sure. you know, him kind of wielding the pen in that way, especially in a city like New York, yeah. you know, it, it's a big deal. But, you know, it, it's still kind of the same today. It's just not typically, you know, newspaper writers, it's TV personalities. Or Facebook you know, bloggers. Exactly, especially Facebook bloggers. Yeah. But, you know, so I, it is an interesting cultural yeah. shift. Yeah. But he, you're right. I mean, he could have easily been either one of those other things and absolutely 
still not another good person. It. I don't know how well I think this all worked. I still have to think about it more. Mm -hmm. Was his sister um, Susie, because she is such she is such a linchpin of the ending of the mm -hmm. movie. But a lot of parts of the movie, she felt like just like a throwaway character like for a, a long time, like a yeah. prop. Yeah. So I don't know exactly how well that worked for me. I don't know like how strong of a female character she was. What do you think? What do you know about this? Well, uh, I will out. say uh, she's very different. So the, the the movie's based on a novella by Ernest Lehman, who also wrote the screenplay. Uh, and she's much different in that. So she's a lot snarkier. She's a lot, mm -hmm. a lot more cynical. More in line with you would imagine, you know, J.J. Hunsecker's sister being. You know, I really uh, felt like see. for this, for the movie, they kind of played up kind of the weak-willed kind of, you know, especially for their relationship. Right. You know? I mean, which is the same in the book, you know, where he kind of controls her, but it's it just feels different. I could see her, if she was a stronger woman, I think that would have made a lot more sense to me. Like how the whole movie, you know, builds toward the end. It wouldn't feel like she's just a lot on this passenger ride, and then at the very last couple of minutes, she takes control of the wheel. You know, right. like I would have liked to seen, I think, more of that version. Yeah, but I could also see that being part of the timepiece. You know, the time period, the choices the studio would have made for her. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's really closer to the point is what the studio was willing to give her as a role in the fifties. But uh, I agree. I think that little kind of like shift at the end was like obviously uh, the nod to the book and mm -hmm. to kind of complete her arc and really you know while it is while this story does center a lot around Sidney Falco and J.J. Hunsecker a lot of it is about Susie because she really like you said she is the linchpin and not just the end but she's kind of the, the focal point of the story you know both of these characters are really focusing on her and her relationship with Dallas the yeah. jazz musician so that kind of drives the story forward so she really is a you know main character in that in that respect she is but but the movie doesn't feel like that until the very very end which right. kind of made like makes you feel almost like you missed out or made kind of makes me feel like did i miss out on like watching her closely enough and paying attention because right. i didn't feel like she was important and then last time like oh yeah she is she is important so right. i thought that just felt a little weird well you know and you brought up the studio aspect of it which is true and there's a lot of inherent misogyny even within this story sure. so you know you mentioned earlier about sydney falco you know Fish. selling out the cigarette I girl which that scene i would imagine the favor, was was weird yeah. it's almost you. weird now it is brutal but cult. darkly comedic very you know very but, but it's but it is brutal i mean so it, it's very hard to kind of sit there and watch it and stomach it at the same time but you're Here's right i mean with home. sid or with sydney's view of of, I feel like the women around him, there is that inherent misogyny. So, you know, Susie fits right into that. You know, she is a quote unquote prop. And yeah. even to JJ Hunsecker, in a way, you know, while he kind of puts her up on this pedestal, it is the pedestal that he controls. He moves that pedestal. Right. So, uh, you know, I think for. For for what they were trying to do in the movie, it does work, but I can definitely see where you're coming from with making her maybe more of a forceful character. Yeah, I think it works in the movie for sure. I just think what you're telling me about the book might sound a little better to me. So, you right. know, we've, no. we've talked about these three characters, probably the main three characters of the movie, a couple of, you know, other really important characters that serve great purposes, because this is such a character piece. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you, you will have to watch this movie and really appreciate the characters yeah. that you're watching on screen. That's the journey you ride. But there were some other cool things. One thing that stood out to me, which I don't have any frame of reference for, but mm -hmm. was the dialogue. Like, the dialogue is very noticeable, right. like, that it's different. Yeah. Um, so was is that just fifties? Like there was that noir thing, but there were so many like similes and metaphors. And, yeah. Is that normal? Was that normal? <laughs> no, it is not normal. In fact, the first time I saw this movie, uh, I mentioned you know the theater experience, which was amazing. Uh, my friend Popcraft before he we went in said, "Okay, this movie this movie is incredible." But the people don't talk like this, right? And that's what smart makes, right, like this, what makes this movie so amazing is that people don't talk like this. But it really does, you know, like you, it kind of has that noir type thing sure. you mentioned, and you know, it, but every other line is, a, is it's like in a simile or metaphor, and you're like, I'm going to try and jot that one down in my brain to use it someday. But right, oh yeah, too many. But you know, I, it's interesting because I think certain aspects of it, you know, because really the, the two key players I feel like when it comes to that dialogue are, you know, JJ uh, Hunsecker and. Sidney Falco. Sure. And they got 90% of the dialogue. Right. And I think 
really their dialogue and the way that they speak kind of lends to this idea of overconfidence. So yes, J.G. Hunsaker is a powerful man. He, you know, wields the pen. Politicians fall at his feet. You know, actors and actresses beg to, you know, be in his column. And in the end, he still... Oh, he's a normal person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's just a normal person. And it all kind of goes to the way that he carries himself. So this dialogue really lends to that smooth talking type of thing. Yeah, and with Sydney's, Sydney's no different. Yeah. You know, he's just trying to climb the ladder still. Yeah, feed off that power, yeah. you know, it's kind of like... <laughs> and it, it, you know, it... it it works though. It's such a memorable thing yeah. about this movie. Well, once you once you get used to it, you're almost like now anticipating it. Yeah. So it kind of made it. I mean, it was almost another thing to watch for. Yeah. Like, what are they going to say? You yeah. Know? Well, Layman, Ernest Lehman, who I mentioned, wrote, wrote the novella and the screenplay. You know, he wrote a, a bunch of really great Hollywood classics. So North by Northwest. He wrote West Side Story, the film adaptation of Sound of Music. Uh, you know, so the list goes on and on, and. He really captured, like I said, these two characters and in the way they speak says so much, almost in some ways more than what they're actually saying mm -hmm. in this weird way, if you get my point. Like, again, going back to that whole idea of overconfidence. Sure. And also the, the, the way the movie was shot. You know, it's 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 kind of like feels small and dark because they're they're a lot in clubs a lot and yeah. it's at night a lot, and then the movie ends with that big shot of her walking into the light, Susie. Yeah. And so I mean, I kind of thought, thought that was interesting the way that the whole movie played like that. Yeah, it played with contrast, which you know a lot of black and white movies do, especially if you're going for that noir type feel. But this one did it a lot and did it really well. You know, if you if you notice some of the shots of you know J.J. Hunsecker and, and and even Sidney Falco at times they shoot him a lot where his face is like half in dark mm -hmm. half in light saying a lot about the you know the overall character his you know internal spirit if you will sure. uh, but you know there, there's a lot there's a lot of really amazing things they do with the cinematography a lot of great scenes you know, I feel like there's a lot of really interesting, subtle moments. You know, yeah. so like that at the end of that whole opening sequence with JJ and and Sidney Falco when they're out on the street, and you know JJ gets in the car, drives away, like he he gets burned, Sidney real exhaust. quick by the exhaust. Yeah. You know, and, it's and on the leg. Right, exactly. You know, and there and there's little things where uh, you know uh, Sidney gets his fingers caught in the door when he's trying to chase Sidney. Yeah, or, she shuts the door. Susie, and yep, and it, it's interesting because. It, it always kind of, a, in a way, revolves around Sydney getting hurt, but that's kind of the point. And, you know, so there's a lot of really amazing shots in this movie that are really subtle, and it's just really genius. And I think a lot of movies from today really, you know, if they haven't you know, been uh, influenced by this movie, really could be. If sure. All right, so wrapping it up, Ray. Okay. Final thought, sweet smell of success. I Let think, me have it. I think this movie did have a sweet smell that was successful for me. Ah. You know, I like I like to have fun when I watch a movie, and like I've said before, but you know, for me, fun is is just be able to appreciate a movie, and I think to appreciate this movie because you know it was made in the '50s, so I think you know not everybody who's in the modern audience is gonna probably love it, but I think if you can go to a movie and like to watch a strong character piece, because this is certainly that. I think I will say I walked away and thinking that Sidney Falco for me, stood out as a character that I really just loved watching. I could have yeah. watched him for another hour and a half, probably. Sure. Um, but, you know, so if, you, if you're the kind of person who likes to watch characters go on that journey, that maybe they, you know, they try to ascend to something and fail, and maybe you're rooting for them to fail, or you don't know what you're rooting for while you watch it, but, you know, if you like that, if you can appreciate, you know, the clever and unique dialogue and that kind of stuff, I think you'll love this movie. I think it's set, I think that's, you know, it's set right up there for you. It's low-hanging fruit. You're going to enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I guess that's what I feel about yeah. it. I mean, in, you know, it's still relevant. You know, yeah. there's a lot of brutality in the entertainment industry then and now. You know, sure. we've seen other movies swimming with sharks in the player that have kind of, you know, taken probably cues from this movie. And this may have been a fashionably late review. For us, yeah. But it is definitely a fashion that has not gone out of style. All right, everybody. Well, I hope you liked our introduction to our fashionably late series. And if you know the movie that me and Robbie are fashionably late to, let us know in the comments below. Are you a fan of the Sweet Smell of Success? I also want to see that in the comments below. Also, hit the like and subscribe button to catch all of our upcoming videos. And until then, this is Car Ray Rob. I'm Ray. I'm Rob. Gentlemen, gentlemen, there's no fighting in here. This is the War Room.